Welcome. Welcome to this live event. Uh, I'm Richard Wiseman, a psychologist and author of this amazing book, David Copperfield's History of Magic. And for the next hour, we're going to be talking uh, to the legend uh, himself and uh, having a live book signing as we say hello to Mr. David Copperfield. Very nice to see you again, David. Uh, it's good to be with you again. Very good. I'm Very really good. proud of what we did together on this book. It is really, really beautiful. And I can't wait to give it away as Christmas gifts. It's, it's a great Christmas gift. That's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Um, and let's, I, I'm over in the UK. I've been uh, in Scotland. Where, where do we find you? I am in Tannen's Magic Shop, the recreation of Tannen's Magic Shop in my museum. It's the way that people get to be introduced to this world of magic in the same way I got introduced to magic. I walked into a magic shop and I went, oh my gosh, I'm in heaven. So I recreated that magic store here at the beginning, the opening of the museum. So it's a pretty cool place. And, and we should explain to folks, um, you're obviously doing live shows in, in Vegas, uh, two or three shows a, a day. And then you have this, this secret museum of magic, which I've been lucky enough to, to visit. It's an astounding, astounding place. Do you want to give us a feel for how, how big the museum is? Because obviously the book takes people through that museum and through the history of magic. So, so give us a feel for, for the astonishing place that you've created over there. It's a giant, giant place that really weaves through centuries of magic history and amazing stories of individuals that we can really relate to. Uh, people who, like Houdini, who escaped from things, uh, people who uh, read people's minds, people who uh, uh, sawed people in half. Some actually put them back together, too. That was a good thing. Uh, the sawing in half is bit. easy. I've heard, that's, that's the tricky bit I've heard. Uh, it's true. Uh, and we go through all of that stuff and tell amazing stories of how magic has influenced not just magicians and audiences, but also society and invention and and uh, uh, the whole world of invention, uh, of uh, robotics, of cinema, of film, um, and really, you know, change the world. And uh, so I'm really proud of it. And you're proud of it too, right? I, I, absolutely. And we should say it's a, it's a big color book. It really does give people, there's a, a big double page spread there of uh, Robert Dudan, um, his apparatus. It, and it was co-written with David Britland and amazing um, photographs by uh, Homer Liwag. And, and so it is a, a, this, this big color book that takes us through the, the history of magic as, as seen uh, by your, your wonderful, wonderful collection uh, over there. So, mm -hmm. and, and folks can buy, I think there's a, a link below and there'll be uh, links coming up uh, on, on the video as well. We have got lots and lots of live uh, questions from folks. And I think we're gonna get more if you, if you uh, want to submit others, uh, please do that. But I think we could jump straight in uh, because there's a question here by a fellow Brit. Uh, Mark, who's over in uh, Suffolk, he says, look forward to reading the book. Uh, so that's good. Uh, now, what is your favorite illusion to perform? Well, my uh, illusions in my show, we actually discuss in the end of this book. There's a whole section about uh, illusions that I do in my show. And, um, you know, the answer is whatever I'm working on that's new. Right now, I mean, we talk about this whole section about um, the, the, the death saw, which is an illusion that I did many years ago, which is my version of the sawing in half illusion, which was done as an escape. Um, it wasn't done as a sawing in half. It was me having to escape from the, this big saw, which is going to saw, saw me in half. And, and I don't escape <laughs> and I get cut in half and, uh, you know, and uh, that's the way it goes. But I, do, I, I didn't want it to, to, to do it to a, another person. I wanted it to happen to me. I wanted to do it as an escape. And I turned time backwards to kind of solve my problem. But the death saw was a really important uh, illusion in, in, in my career and kind of changed uh, the way we thought of that. You know, currently in my show, I do things with, with uh, dinosaurs and, uh, and spaceships and aliens, there's a little alien there. So we really, you know, magic goes through all these centuries of, of amazing uh, inventions and creations. And uh, it ends up, all, this is all through my point of view, obviously, uh, ends up where I've been taking magic lately. Here's my, uh, here's a big spaceship, which appears in my show. Spoiler alert, you get to see that it comes to my live show. Um, explain this museum, uh, we don't, open it to the public. Explain why, Richard. Uh, well, it's like a lot of magic 
it's, it's, it's full of secrets. It's full of secret stuff. And, and so it would be a little bit problematic to make it a, a, a public uh, museum. And we should explain to people that there is a whole secret world of magic. And this book takes you into that, that secret world in terms of, uh, you know, the, the dealers that will sell you magic tricks and the community that's magic and the, the vast kind of literature of magic and also the evolution of magic. I mean, you mentioned the death saw there, but that builds on the, the shoulders of giants. It builds on the people that went before in order to, to create that, that wonderful illusion. And it was it was kind of fun to put together, wasn't it? Mm. It just shows how he got in, inspired by all these things and how magic keeps moving forward through time, not just in magic, but also in society. Uh, the first smart home was invented by a magician. The first smart home, uh, doors that open by themselves and things that work automatically were done as pieces of magic. And uh, eventually those secret stuff becomes part of the public for public use. And there's many examples of that in the book, how magic has changed things. And uh, we continue to try to do that. When you're performing your shows and you have something, you, you know something amazing is about to happen and you know the audience don't know what's coming, is, is that a kind of exciting moment? Is, is it hard to kind of keep it in because you want to kind of blurt out, you know, there's this amazing thing about to happen? Yeah. There's, there's a movie, I forget what it was, about stand-up comedians. Uh, I forgot the name of it, uh, but anyway, um, and somebody I'm sure will tell us, they talk about having material they know is going to make the audience explode comedically, you know, and they know they have this, this power. And because they've done it before, so they know it's going to work. Um, and you unleash that, that joke in the case of comedy, and you get, hopefully you get the reaction that you expect. In magic, it's the same thing, but maybe even more so because it's a sense of wonder and awe. You know, I walk and see in front of the audience and I see them really needing to escape. I, I watch their faces and they come there wanting to get out of all of the, the stuff that's, you know, hitting us every day. And, um, and it's an amazing feeling, you know, to know that you're going to unleash something that's going to make people dream. Uh, we have uh, Daniel uh, from Idaho, and Daniel's asking, uh, he's a big fan, seen all your TV specials, been to your Vegas show uh, many times. What do you consider to be your greatest illusion? You know, um, I enjoy, I mean, I've done some things that I think are pretty good. I think flying was, you know, um, pretty good in the show. Uh, I think the death saw was pretty good. I think you know, the spaceships and, and uh, you know, and dinosaurs and all that stuff, everything I'm working on new, I really, really enjoy. Um, I'm creating new th things now, new technology. And as you can explain to them, magic and technology are really hand in hand. Um, I am fortunate enough to get to see new technology before other people get to see it. People bring me things. I'm so lucky to have friends that uh, kind of share what the future holds. And I get to use those things uh, because it is quite magical. It's indistinguishable from magic, you know, new technology, um, as Arthur C. Clarke said. Uh, you know, I really uh, enjoy sharing new ideas and um, uh, inventing new things, which hopefully the public will be able, be able to use someday, is very rewarding to me. And, and of course, it's a double-edged sword because you have to rule out possible technological um, innovation. So when, when people went to see Houdini, they weren't thinking about holograms. When they come and see your show and a big spaceship appears, you have the possibility, at least in their heads, that that's a hologram. It's got to be ruled out and, and so on. So I guess it, it makes you, stretches you in that way. You're right. And, you know, you have to make that spaceship fly over their heads and they see it in every direction and they watch it, you know, uh, uh, they watch it really above their head so they know it can't be that because they're seeing it every single direction um so it's it's really a wonderful thing to be challenged by te technology and also everything that's happening in movies today all the cgi all those things are really inspiring to me i have to kind of fight to be as good as that to be as good as a marvel movie you know to be as good as james cameron back in the day uh, and um you know people say well how are you going to compete with that and i said well let me just Let's get to work. Yeah. Um, we have uh, Mark, actually from Bathgate, uh, not very far from here, actually. Um, David, a uh, big fan. Uh, what's your favorite magic trick as performed 
by another magician. And, and I'll, I'll give you a moment to think about that. I, I, I hope I'm on camera at the moment. So I, I thought I'd give you a clue, uh, which, because we've chatted about this before. This is a perfectly empty tube. Yes. And yet, you yeah, know, yeah. So That's pretty damn it, good. It's, it's so within Mark's question of what's your favorite magic trick as performed by another uh, magician, would that, what I've just done, would that be up there? Uh, maybe number two. Maybe number two. <laughs> I think, um, you know, of the classic pieces of magic, Robert Houdin invented uh, the ethereal levitation. And you can explain, why don't you explain why it's called the ethereal levitation? It's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful bit. So so we're going back um, uh, in, in in time to when ether ether was around, and ether had just been uh, in, uh, created, and they knew it could do amazing things, knocking people out and, and uh, helping them not to feel pain and so on. So Robert Houdin had this idea that he would use it as a kind of um, frame to present a, a, a suspension. So he would bring on uh, his son. He would uh, apparently uh, get him to smell some ether, and then his son would be sort of suspended at a strange angle, as if he'd become lighter than air uh, for, uh, on, on stage. And so it's another use of technology, actually. It's a technology to sort of throw the audience off on a, mm. a, a, the, the wrong scent, uh, as it were. And here is, the, here is the actual picture of the sun being uh, levitated. If you can go to my shot there, there's the picture of him being levitated in that effect. Well, um, Houdin did that in the 1840s and 50s, um, jump forward to the 1950s and 60s, and a guy named Ricciardi uh, took that illusion and made it a masterpiece and performed a beautiful, here, here he is doing, here's Ricciardi doing the exact same illusion. But if you ever want to Google that, him doing it, you'll see something that's spectacular and very inspiring. And, you know, during my show, I mean, look at his body movement. It's like, yeah. it's incredible. And during my show, you know, I, I actually think of Ricciardi from time to time. And it helps me say, okay, I want the movement to be that good. So that's a, one of the things that I would say is a great, great piece performed by somebody else. And, uh, yes. and returning to Robert Houdin, just for, for a moment, obviously magicians keep their secrets. We, we, we can't say um, how he, he achieved that. It requires a secret something. And I know that, that, which is an incredibly rare something, piece of apparatus, and you, you possess it. Do you want to talk us through uh, holding that, coming into contact with that for the, the, the very first time? Well, you know, I had... Um... Guillermo del Toro here and he toured the museum and he saw all the things of George Méliès and George Méliès if you saw the movie Hugo uh, was one of the fathers of cinema and special effects but storytelling using this magic trick of movies and uh, when he saw the items of George Méliès he began to get very emotional he started to tear up and uh and I said, why are you crying? And he said, well, that's the beginning of it all. This is the beginning of the cinema, this is the beginning of storytelling. And there it is, the beginning of it. Well, for me, the example, even though I love cinema and I'm very inspired by it, um, the apparatus, the little secret technology to make the woman in this case, or a son in that case, uh, levitate or be suspended in a precarious way, uh, that piece of apparatus was put into my hands in Paris about 20 years ago. And I had the same reaction as Del Toro had about Melies. I got, you know, I'm holding it. This is the beginning of why I do what I do. You know, uh, it started, it's a thing that for me started it all. And 20 years passed by and now it's in my possession. And we talk about it in the book, um, but, but it's the, the, those kind of anchoring moments it's like when Bill Gates got the Codex Leicester, you know, the, the Da Vinci stuff, but kind of is very moving because it, it shows us that the importance of those dreamers back then. And, and we should say that, um, I, I don't know how often you do it, but you, you give personal tours of the museum uh, to very small numbers of people because, the, as we say about the secrecy, and, and in this book, you know, you're, you're taking readers on that personal tour through these amazing exhibits. Okay. And, and these are exhibits which 
have created or changed history and obviously shaped magic. I mean, you have this astonishing collection of Houdini uh, apparatus there. I mean, how, how does it feel to, to be so close to that, this, this iconic magician and, and, and everything he owned pretty much you, you have there? Yeah. Well, it's pretty, pretty amazing. You know, you learn a lot about an individual when you have their items in your possession. You have a new respect for them how things were built, the, the thought and detail that they, care, they cared about. There's a, an illusion um, called the metamorphosis, tr metamorphosis, and it's a trunk. And, um, and you know, it's been done many times since uh, Houdini did it. He made it famous and people have continued to do this kind of illusion. But looking at his actual prop, he made it so it could be examined and could be used to transport things. Uh, the actual trunk dividers could be put in the trunk so you could use it as a real trunk mm. beyond using it as an effect. And those dividers prevented any secrets to be shown. So I love that idea, that discovery that uh, he took the time, his people took the time to put these little dividers in that allowed it to be used as a real trunk, uh, as anyone would use a trunk. And in doing so, prevented any kind of secret to be discovered. Loved it. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's such an amazing collection. Um, and we should say to folks, if, you, if you're just listening in, I think the, the link to buy the, uh, the book is below. I think it's coming up as well uh, during our, our chat. Uh, we have a, another question here from uh, Kara, who's in uh, California. I think I know the answer to this, but I, I, I don't think we've spoken about it before. Have you ever wanted uh, to leave magic and start something completely new? You know, for me, I mean, I love film. I would if I wasn't doing this, I'd be a film director, but I think we're in good hands. There's so many great film directors around. I try to do my, uh, you know, my, my, uh, uh, my magic as if they were films and if, as if they were movies. So I get a chance to, uh, to kind of expand that, um, that passion. You know, I'm signing these book plates for you guys. I'm gonna sign some book plates. I'm gonna sign some books too. Um, and um, yeah, I'd be a film director, but right now I get to be a film director in my show. I tell big stories with uh, about family, about you know time travel, and, uh, and I really, really enjoy it. Very yeah. good, very good. Uh, we have Benjamin, who is uh, in North Cal uh, Cal uh, Carolina. Sorry, I was about to say California, Cal Carolina. Uh, what? Oh, okay. What is the easiest card trick that's really good? Hmm. Wiseman, what do you think? I would go with the card trick, which I've been performing for 30 years, which is that you have a card like this one, what's this one, seven of diamonds in your pocket. And uh, when you're just with somebody, you say, name a card. And if they name the seven of diamonds, you take it out and you have a miracle. But most of the time you just move on the conversation and it's quite disappointing for everyone. I've been doing it for 30 years. And very rarely do I get any response at all. But when I do, it's worth it. <laughs> so literally, you carry that card around seven just in case they would pick that seven of diamonds. Absolutely. As and they like, rarely do. It's not a commonly chosen card. Why don't you pick something better? Well, that's why you're a legendary magician. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, can I give you a plug? Look at folks at home. If you want to see some really cool magic to share, Quirkology.com. Quirkology, is it .com? Uh, something like that. Quirkology on YouTube, yes. On YouTube. Yeah. Check it out. You'll see amazing things, and you'll learn lots about magic and, uh, and how we perceive things, our perception of how our brain can fool us. You know, Richard is a brilliant uh, oh. psychologist and uh, brilliant yeah. magician. Check you're, that out. You're, you're, you're too kind. But, um, yeah, seven of diamonds in your pocket. And you rarely get a reaction, but when you do, uh, it's, it's almost worth it. But it's borderline even then, actually, to be honest. Richard, um, let's, yeah. talk, let's talk about magic books uh, that are accessible, that people can learn from. You know, um, what do you think? Royal Road to Card Magic, uh, uh, the Tarbell Course in Magic. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's, what I love about magic there's just so many hobbies and interests where you have to spend a fortune uh, in order to really get into them. And with magic, you can go and buy yourself a decent deck of cards and that could be you for the rest of your life. And, and, and so it's actually a fairly inexpensive uh, interest to pursue. 
I think, and there is a book, uh, The Royal Road to Card Magic, which you learn that cover to cover uh, is, is, is a fantastic um, introduction. Right? There's quite a few of them out there now. It's, it, it's astonishing, um, which, yeah, really, really take the beginners through the whole, the whole kind of gamut, right, right up to uh, amazing, amazing stuff. And because it's good, it's not only about performing amazing uh, kind of miracles you know you're learning social skills you're learning confidence you're learning dexterity uh, you're learning in my case uh, what to do when things go wrong when they don't choose the seven of diamonds so a bit resilient <laughs> as well um, so it's it's a it's a good old thing to be into I think particularly uh, encouraging younger folks uh, to be into you, you have project magic of course yeah and you can look at projectmagic.org online projectmagic.org and you'll learn about magic and therapy but you also learn a bunch of magic stuff that you could actually use projectmagic.org uh it's i've got a program that uses magic in hospitals as a form of therapy but those yeah. pieces of magic are kind of good beginner magic effects anyway besides being therapeutic in value it's it's yeah it's a wonderful project it's wonderful uh john who is in uh, michigan uh, what advice? Okay, so this is going slightly outside of magic, saying obviously you've been incredibly successful in your career. Uh, what advice and motivation can you share uh, that made you the successful person you are today? So, what 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 qualities have brought you to the the top of of, of well the magic game and the, the show business game? Well, I think that's very kind. I'm still working on it, by the way. I'm not <laughs> sure I'm there yet, but I'm I'm I'm. Uh... I think that point of view is a good point of view to have, to not feel like you've done it. I think I always feel a little bit hungry. But for me, it was looking outside of my field. You know, I looked at Frank Sinatra and Frank Sinatra didn't copy other singers. He copied uh, saxophone players, phrasing of a saxophone player, uh, people who look beyond their own skill uh, and try to combine that uh, have had great success. I mean, uh, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, was a calligrapher. He loved calligraphy. And that informed, I think, the Apple products at the time. The attention to, to visuals and so forth was very, very important. It wasn't about the computer. It was about uh, what the computer could do and what could achieve in, in people's lives. And I think in, in my world, you know, I cared about the music was important and the, the story was important and all those things. You know, it's, uh, you know, remember movies, uh, was a magic effect. Really, magicians did that as a trick, but then it didn't stay as movies. The music is important, the story is important, the characters are important, all that. And I, I try to do that with my magic. My magic was is far beyond uh, the invention of the effect, far beyond uh, the, uh, the wow of how did you do that? And what else, what other layers can you put on that? And sometimes it works great and sometimes it doesn't work so great, but at least I try and keep pushing it. And that's the difference. And, and having worked with you on the book, I mean, even though you have obviously an absolutely packed schedule, uh, you always found time to work on this and, and, and you work really, really hard on everything you do. It's astonishing. Yeah, I think that's hard work is important. I talk about three P's, passion, preparation and persistence. You know, passion, you have to love something to begin with. And I was so lucky to find something I loved. So lucky. A lot of people are still finding it. And you will find it. You'll find what you love. But when you find something you love that you're passionate about, that's step one. Step two is preparation. Learn everything you can about it. Um, research everything and prepare for the worst. And then the third P is persistence because it's never going to get easy. You're going to have to keep pushing and people are going to say, no, you can't do that. It's not going to work and be persistent and follow what you really want to do. And that's, that's uh, helped me a lot. And talking about Anne has asked, uh, how old were you when you performed your first magic trick? About eight, about eight years old. You know, it's a um, funny old age that, isn't it? Because I think that's the age that most people get into magic. I was eight when I got into magic. How come? Uh, my grandfather showed me a, a, a coin trick. What was it? He took a coin. Uh, it was a Victorian penny. And he had me write my initials on it and he made it disappear. And then he opened a little box, which had got some bands on. I took them off. Inside was another box with some bands on. Inside that was a little bag. And inside that was my initialed penny. It's a great, it's a great effect. It's a classic effect, but it really is a great effect, isn't it? I mean, it really, really uh, is clean idea, you know borrowed object that's marked and appears someplace else and you know can imagine how that affects it's, it's oh, not just 
managing a plan a year. He went through the length of that, you know, having that, that on top of it. So that's, that's pretty good. You know, it, thank your grandfather. Say hello. Oh, I, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. It's astonishing. So it was, um, it was great. Uh, now I have one here, which, um, so this is from Ronald in New Jersey. He was your assistant Mork when you performed Dreams and Nightmares on Broadway. Hmm. Uh, My, what? My assistant Mork? Mork. Mork. Hmm. Are we, we thinking it's Robin Williams and uh, with Mindy, you know, I don't know, Mork. I don't know. Hmm. I was your assistant Mork. Oh, Mort, Mort, M-O-T, Mort. Oh, well, okay, sorry, it says Mork here, but maybe it is M-O-T, right. M-O-T, yeah, tra- over time, he became Mork. He went to the space age. No, I named, uh, I kind of made made fun of my Aunt Ida and Uncle Morty from Brooklyn. Uh, Aunt Ida and Uncle Morty. And uh, yeah, I levitated him, this <laughs> person. And uh, I had two guys on stage. And I called them Aunt Ida and Uncle Morty. And I'd levitate them. And uh, yeah, that was really, you could look it up on, uh, it's the okay. couch levitation. Yeah, it's, it's not bad. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you for coming back. Thank you for keeping my secret. <laughs> well, Ronald's saying, um, would you like to go back to Broadway again if you had the opportunity? You know, it was a great experience. We broke a lot of records. It was a collaboration with me and Francis Ford Coppola. Great, amazing experience. It's one of my heroes. And I got to work with one of my heroes. There's a show called Dreams and Nightmares. You know, um, it's always possible. You know, I, I think it's a really good idea. I'm a, I've been inspired by Broadway in a gigantic way. You know, I used to go there when I was... A kid, uh, Ben Vereen, gigantic Broadway star, was my hero at the time. And I'd see, uh, I got to hang out with Bob Fosse and see the show called Pippin with a bunch of magic in it. I get to help out with that a little bit when I was 15 and 16 years old. It's just that, you know, Broadway means a lot to me. Whenever I go, I'm so happy it's open again, live theater on Broadway. Obviously, I'm doing a Broadway kind of show here in Las Vegas. But the Broadway itself carries so much uh, passion for me and the inspiration it's, it's fantastic so you never know thanks for okay thinking about it. uh well another uh well question from your um about new jersey uh well that's an interesting one this is from george who is in new Jer- jersey uh what's your favorite non-magic memory growing up in new jersey um my favorite memory well it wasn't a good memory it was Ray Perone, who was my fifth grade teacher. Uh, I used to chew on pencils mm-hmm. you know, and eat the eraser, <laughs> eat the eraser. <laughs> and the end of the pencil, the metal that would hold the eraser was like splayed out like a, like razor blades. It was hard. And, and I would just do it as a nervous kid. And I would do it in fifth grade. And um, the guy walked past my desk and opened the, this one. Remember the desk that opened up in England? Yeah, you had yeah. desk that opened up and had stuff inside. It was a mess. I'm totally, I'm very organized now. At the time I was not. And he looked at this thing and he had me stand up as he, he got, scraped his hand on my pencil because of the razor blade effect of the pencil. And he made me stand up and took the, the desk and pulled it to the back of the room and dumped all the stuff on the floor in the back of the class and made me sit in it. <laughs> and I looked at Kathy Koff, the love of my life um, uh, at the time who would never give me, a, you know, uh, any, any, she never paid any attention to me, but I looked at her and I'm sitting in this pile of stuff. And it, it's funny that it made me work harder. It really made me work harder. I ended up getting five A's that semester and he was the best teacher I ever had, you know? So for me, stuff you could never do today, you know, the, 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 the nun with the, with the ruler thing, it wasn't that bad, but it was kind of like that, that huge embarrassment really motivated me it kind of worked for me that negative stuff you can't do that today it doesn't exist you have to be nicer and be kinder and I, i'm all for being kind but for me that kind of worked that a tough love made yes. me more organized and made me work hard so there's a memory why did i think of that but there you, there you go my my main memory as a teenager i used to work in a um on a checkout of a, a big supermarket i don't know if you have them in the states but we have seven items or less so till that lane that lane is seven items or less that's correct and you were on that because you were a bad bagger uh, no i was on that because i was so fast i was so that because i had a big uh through of customers anyways having a bad day and this woman bought through a box of cornflakes 
And I said, I can't put that through because there's hundreds of items in there. <laughs> I thought it was a good line and they met, they sacked me for that. I lost my job. <laughs> <laughs> she went and complained. There's a uh, thousand yeah. cornflakes yeah. in the box. There's thousands in there. That You can't possibly get that past me. And uh, that, that was, yeah. Uh, that, that's the that was the end of my um, my my days work, working in the store. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> what was the name of the store? I want to know what was the name of it. No, I better not say. I better not say. It's a well a well known a well known. Well, because I think they sacked me unfairly, and I, I'm say still the busy. name. No, no, it's <laughs> I don't know because a big store. I'll, I'll get into trouble, okay. um, and uh, they'll they'll make me go back there and work on there. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so many questions uh, coming here. Okay, uh, Damien, uh, who is in Poland, actually. Damien from Poland, hello. Uh, close up or big illusions, uh, which one do you prefer? Which, which is better uh, from your perspective? Well, you know, both are relevant. Both are important. I've done both. Uh, obviously, I love, you know, for me, it's about storytelling and it's easier to tell a story on stage with bigger things for me. It's harder to tell stories. In you can do it with close-up magic, obviously. Uh, there's many versions of storytelling magic in close-up, and they work really, really well. But for me, you know, I really, uh, uh, I like them both, and they both are very valid. And certainly there's been a resurgence in, resurgence in close-up magic with all the street performers and close-up performers that do that. Um, that wasn't, exi when I was starting magic, to make a living doing close-up magic didn't exist. There were certain people, legendary, Max Molini, who we talk about in the book, and uh, Slidini, all these people who did close-up magic. But the people who were, you know, making a living at it mostly were big stage performers. And that's why I followed that path, just because I wanted to show my mother that I could, you know, could feed a family with this stuff. <laughs> um, but um, but were, you parents, were you parents supportive? Have you doing magic? Um, somewhat, you know. My mother was very afraid, you know, uh, about about uh, I would be able to have a career at this thing. Very, very afraid. So um, she, she gave me a lot of tough love, to like Ray Perot and the teacher, um, you know. But that worked for me. Again, that that was a a positive thing for me. You, were your parents supportive? They were actually, because my my mum was a dressmaker, so she used to make the outfits that I wore on stage. Oh, and, really? Wow. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so I still have them. I don't fit into them anymore, but I still I still have them. So yeah, that was that was very supportive. My poor you dad. Did flower trick with the tube? No, I had to, no. That's a no, the sad thing is that's that's a recent purchase. Oh. <laughs> that's yeah, no, no. I, my, my poor dad used to drive me around to all these kids parties that I used to do, and 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 so and sit in the car for an hour outside, and then mm -hmm. uh, drive me back again. So which because at the time, well, I was just focusing on doing the show, and I forgot that you know you got some. Poor person outside sitting in the cold for an hour. You should have brought him in so you could start the music cues, like my uncle would start the, you know, have this Kesri. Here's the music, play Love is Blue, play Hawaii 5 0 here when I say this, hit the button. <laughs> uh, didn't have him do that, huh? Yeah. No, I didn't have any music cue, I didn't have any music. So oh. you, you, that was, was that doing kids' shows or you, you doing oh, that for adults? Kids' shows and adults too, but you know, uh, yeah, there's been a, somebody found all the clippings of me as a kid. And I was, you know, the, I recreated my little act here. I kind of, what I could find, I have the real thing, but I recreated the other stuff. But having, you know, re remembering going to those birthday parties and doing those shows, setting up my stuff, making balloon, an did you make balloon animals? We all made balloon animals. Well, <laughs> except we all, we all, what did we make? A sausage dog that turned into a giraffe. And that was about it. Yeah. They all look like poodles. You know, they were all, all like poodles. Yes. But, uh, uh, yeah. Anyway. And the elephant, I can get an elephant to curve the beak and I would straighten that. It was bad. That, but that, uh, was, good. that was book two. I never got to that. <laughs> yeah. What did you charge for a birthday party? I charged, this is going back, um, my goodness, about 40 years. I charged five pounds. That's, that's like me. Same, five dollars. Five pounds at that time, was it more than dollars, pounds? Uh, yeah, it would have been actually. Yes, it would. It would now. It now it's about the same, but no, it would have been um, so a little bit more, mm -hmm. and it was far more money than I was worth making on the check. Well, actually, more money I was making on the checkout because I got the sack. Um, but yes, yeah, five five pounds and um, me too. Five dollars and then seven fifty and then twelve fifty was a thing. So uh, amazing, amazing. Yeah, it's, it's um, 
Do you miss doing kids shows? Do I miss doing kids shows? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, it's uh, no kids are great. Uh, I'm signing some books too, by the way. Yeah. Um, I would say to folks, these. I'll repeat again. Just the, I think the link is below this and coming up on screen and uh, and everything. So, um, so you don't miss kids shows. You know, I get in my live shows. I have uh, uh, kind of EDM audiences. I have uh, I have uh, you know people from all over Europe and Asia. But then I also get times of the year where it's all families. You know, during spring break in the summertime. So I got a lot of kids in the audience too. And I kind of walked the very delicate line of be, doing an adult show, but uh, with uh, things that kids can hear, but flies over their head, you know, some of the more adult material. Um, so it's or a safe family show, but there's enough for the adults uh, yeah. to, to enjoy those things. But I, you um, know, the kids are there. They're really, you know, you watch their faces and they're, they're, you're creating a memory for them that they'll have, you know, 50 years from now. And that's, that's a good thing. Um, I, I used to quite enjoy them. I used to, um, I used to enjoy the, um, well, trying to eat as much as they, they used to have jelly and what we call bemonge. I don't know what you call it over in the, the States. And I used to try and eat as much of that as possible uh, before the kids got to the table. Because okay. um, I thought right. I was only charging five pounds. I was trying to get my money's worth as much as uh, anything. Um, so Kevin, who's in uh, Indiana, says that lots of, uh, I mean, have, you have wonderful, wonderful, this is another setup from the, I can't quite see whether we have it there, on the, uh, you, you've recreated these, these kind of incredible rooms, uh, incredible theatres uh, from, from Magic. Of course, a lot of props have been lost over time. Uh, whose who show or which particular prop, if you could go back in time and save something, whose show or, or, or what props would you, would you want to do that to? You know, we have really good stuff, actually, when you think about it. I mean, what are the things that I'm, the things that I'm missing are in other collections that maybe someday I'll be able to acquire. Um, but we have pretty much the key things, right? I mean, what else can you think of? What doesn't exist here, do you think, magic history-wise? Well, in terms of what we're looking at here, which is uh, primarily uh, North American, I mean, in terms of the big golden age of magic, yeah, I mean, I think I think you have the the, the kind of the key the key figures represented there. I always liked. I don't know what happened to it. In fact, the picture we just held up there was of uh, the great Herman Alexander Herman, and and we speak in the book about Herman and his wife Adelaide Herman, who, who then went on did an amazing show. They used to tour around in their own train carriage. I know, wouldn't that be great? Great thing about train carriage, you know? Yes, that would be that would be awesome. I have what's not in the book is I, I vanished an airplane years ago. And um, I was able to get that plane back. Oh, it reappeared. So now I have the world's most expensive, I'm sorry, eh, the world's largest magic collectible, which is the plane I vanished. It was a Learjet. Yeah. And um, so now I have that. It's not in the museum, it's in another facility that I have. But um, uh, yeah. I, I found out the other day that if you look on the um, photograph of that Alexander train carriage, there's guns. Uh, rifles on the wall and those are the ones that he used to do catching the bullets with wow. and he didn't want them anywhere else where anyone might be able to tamper with them yeah. so he kept them on the wall of the, the train carriage um yeah. uh okay so oh so many uh questions uh okay so roger who's in las vegas uh who is the first magician you saw perform live it was probably Rishi Artie or Marvin Roy or Channing Pollock on the Ed Sullivan show. Back in the day, the Ed Sullivan show was the AGT of the time. You know, you'd see the Beatles and you'd see a magician. Fred Capps, you'd see uh, Marvin Roy producing light bulbs, Channing Pollock looking really cool, and Rishi Artie doing amazing uh, performances. Um, it was probably in that, in that place. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have another question here from uh, Thomas, who's in uh, Poland. Um, so social media magic, uh, is, that a char is, is that a good thing for, for magic or is that a bad thing for magic, basically? So we're, we're talking about, you know, these kind of quick magic tricks that look beautiful on, on, on social media. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends how it's done, you know. I think it's good. I think more more things out there. I don't love the exposure videos that exist, you know, or it's just revealing stuff to just to get a quick, you know, clickbait 
kind of kind of thing, you know. Uh, but I think Zach King, I think, is great. You know, he's using technology and special effects, uh, camera effects. He couldn't do those things live, but uh, I think it's a legitimate, you know, medium for 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 doing that. You know, things because at least it's inventive. It's not just doing it for nothing. There's, there's some a lot of thought that goes into it, and, and it looks kind of beautiful in its own way. So. Um, but no, I think the medium uh, of uh, the internet uh, should be embraced, should be embraced. You know, we had this world. This is where we learned all our stuff was here. You know, the actual brick and mortar magic shop. And you had immediately socialization, in-person socialization uh, and learning. On the internet, it doesn't have that, but it has its own value too. And I think it's, you know, it should be embraced and uh, it's the new reality. And I think it's, uh, it's going to be good. And there you're talking about, um, well, you're pointing behind you, Tannins, which was in New York. I, I never went there because I was over in, in London. Uh, but but t- talk us through going to Tannins for the first time, because we talk about that in the, the book and that just blowing your mind, I, I think, in terms of what, what you see there. So talk us through what Tannins meant to you. Well, you walk into this place and it's like... Uh... A Disneyland kind of wondrous place and you know, you know where things were everything was impossible around you that couldn't be done and um, you know it wasn't just me it would be uh, Orson Welles would be you know standing over there and Muhammad Ali is standing over there and J.J. Abrams you know who directed the Star Wars movies very big inspiration being in the magic shop and is what his grandfather you know and his father shared with him and I think it informs storytelling movies all those things I get inspired by, by, by this ability to dream and look at impossible things and the possibilities of, 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 of things that don't exist now. And, and of course, there's tremendous community within magic. And again, the, the book takes you behind the scenes uh, and, and into that, that sense of community and, and, and history. Did you meet folks at, at Tannins that, that kind of shaped your early career? I think so. You know, I... I I was pretty good at magic. I was bad at everything else. Magic, I was good at. So it became very easy to me. But Tannins at the time was right in the middle of Broadway. So I'd go see Broadway shows. I'd sneak into Broadway shows. And I'd go to Tannins. I had this amazing, lucky balance. I grew up in New Jersey. So I'd take an hour bus ride from Metuchee, New Jersey to New York. And I'd go to the Met, hang out with the magicians in this shop and and Al Flasso's shop in New York. And uh, have a camaraderie and then I'd see Broadway shows I saw that what I would eventually combine together that theatrical idea with all the magic uh, putting those things together was what you know formed who I was. Uh, uh, we have another question from uh, Adama in Spain um, you're one of the most influential uh, living magicians uh, in the world but also one of the most copied what's your opinion on that do you find is, is that um, flattering? Is it great that you're inspiring others, or are you just annoyed that it's plagiarism? The last thing I think, you know, it's, it's you know, they say it's the sincerest form of flattery. It's actually the sincerest form of thievery. It's hard to copy. It's hard. Why don't people take the same effort that it takes to copy what I'm doing and create something new? I don't understand. You know, um, I. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's not great because I work so hard on creating new technology for new things, and it does get just copied. Uh, luckily, I'm fortunate enough to to create new things all the time, so I have to like you know put some band aids on the wounds and um, and move forward. And um, and it's yeah. been it's it's it served me well, you know. Okay. I, I think uh, uh, moving forward is a very very important thing. But it's not just me. If you look at Houdini's posters here, you'll see posters of other people copying the exact same thing Houdini did. This existed all throughout our history in magic and movies, everything like that. You see it all the time when you have a successful film or a successful book. They say, okay, this is what we should do, and they copy that thing. And my career is a lot of that, tons of it. And um, uh, I think it should be expected, you know. But uh, it's not fun. No. no. And because uh, there are rules in magic, I mean, if you write something up and you have this colossal library, you know, magic has produced this enormous literature, you are allowed to take from that and to change and improve. That's how magic, but that's not the same as just taking another performer's idea or act. It's a, it's a very um, clear line, but sometimes those lines get blurred. This is the, this is the um, library that, that he's talking about, this amazing thing. And 
we have 7,000 duplicate books, <laughs> 7,000 duplicate books. So you can imagine what's in here. It's an incredible, incredible place. And those things you're allowed to do. You're allowed to, to take those things and, uh, uh, and replicate them and try to change them for yourself. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, so Joan is in Wisconsin says, can you make my husband disappear? Uh, and actually she's only kidding it's their 39th when, uh, wedding anniversary so um she's just saying hi on that and uh rob who's in barnet uh he's saying the evolution of the alien uh party act is clearly a, a labor of love love uh when he first saw it he thought it was called attila uh, the hug yeah. um the sequence is beautiful are you currently developing it continuing to develop it yeah, it keeps changing and growing. It was, you know, it's like a Pixar movie. I get a lot of strength from this Pixar story because they make movies and they talk about them having to suck less, that they spend five years or seven years rewriting and changing and changing. And finally, they release something they're really proud of after seven years. And I went through that process in front of the audience. So they always get to see that process. And, uh, you know, finally got pretty good. Um, and um, it's kind of, was interesting to me because it was a new form. Storytelling with uh, a character, two-person comedy, never did two-person comedy before. Um, that was fun. Uh, telling a story with a character that didn't exist, uh, making a puppet look really real and doing magic that uh, could solve lots of problems, family problems and so forth. And making kind of a Pixar movie, I say very uh, modestly uh, on stage was a kind of an interesting challenge. Uh, Charles in Nashville uh, asks, uh, well, so first of all, says, uh, love the CBS uh, Saturday morning segment. Uh, the museum looks astonishing. Uh, what are your long-term plans for the museum? This place will last a few hundred years, you know, after I'm gone. Uh, I'm endowing it, so it'll continue to teach and inspire, hopefully. Uh, maybe it'll be open to the public at that point. I don't know. Um, but I think, you know, it, we use it to write books. We'll use it to uh, give tours. I take exhibitions from here and put it into other museums, which is awesome. Uh, and uh, it's a resource for filmmakers when they made The Prestige and made uh, The Illusionist. All the filmmakers came here and did research. Um, and, uh, you know, just to try to do things right. And I think those two films, for example, got magic right. Now, the Now You See Me movies, I produced one of them, co-produced one of those, uh, those movies they come here to see the at least the uh, kind of ground zero of, of where magic was and is and can be and, and we should say i mean i i always describe it as the smithsonian of magic or the british museum of magic it, it is an astonishing astonishing uh place and of course magic unlike many performing arts doesn't attract a huge amount of, of public funding so so it is great i think that you're you're doing that you're putting it in one place you're preserving it for the future and you're celebrating it. And, and I think the idea behind the, the book, we both agree, is to try and elevate, you know, the art of magic in order that when people come to see your shows, they just understand something more about the world of magic. Mm -hmm. And how it affects us, how it affects everybody, not just magicians. It affects storytelling, it affects movies, invention, technology. Uh, prototyping the future is a really um, valuable thing that will change the world, I think. And we can do that with illusion. And everything I'm working on now is about trying to, you know, affect daily life, you know, using this art form to kind of influence daily life in a positive way. Uh, Ken, who's in uh, Missouri, uh, Mr. Copperfield, uh, what brings you the most joy or fun uh, that involves magic other than making an audience happy? So actually, I, I let me reword that slightly. It, it, what what do you enjoy doing outside of uh, outside of magic, if if anything at all? I don't know. Well, I really enjoy creating things, and I've got a series of islands in the Bahamas that uh, I've taken the approach that I have on magic presentation, clarity. Um, you know, taking the audience or guests on a journey. I like that. I take what I do well and try to use that in other art forms. So I love, I love, I love creating this resort that I have in the Bahamas called Musha Kay and the islands of Copperfield Bay. Musha Kay and the islands of Copperfield Bay, it's an amazing place. And it's, you know, using my sensibility for that. Um, I have an aviation museum that I'm, 
uh, still working on to help teach kids about dreaming and about how airplanes work and da Vinci and Bernoulli and uh, Sir Isaac Newton, taking that, you know, taking a point of view and uh, things that need to be said and say them with a sensibility that I um, have the ability to do, you know, and uh, that's what I like to do. I love seeing movies. I wish I could go to the movie theater more now. We're starting to have that come back. I can't wait to go and see more, more live theater. I'm happy that's back. Um, I always say, you know, I'm happy when I'm moving the ball forward in some way. I, I, I like that. I loved our experience writing this book because it was kind of, you know, how do you get, how do you get it right? How do you get as, as good as we can get it? And I think we did a, a great job. Yeah, and um, I, I think so. I think, I, I, yeah, I mean, it looks, it looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, and, and also we should mention that, you, you touched on it there with, um, with kids, that what magicians do is take you into this imaginary world where impossible things become possible and I, I find the mindset of magic fascinating because if I said to you oh we need to levitate a table or whatever it is magicians instantly think of how to do that it's in our, our DNA where most people would just go well, don't be silly you can't levitate a, a, a table so just talking about that theme of impossibility and taking people into that imaginary world which you do so brilliantly in, in the, the Vegas shows you know live right in front of their eyes is, is that an important component of, of what you're doing? You know, it's interesting. Magic is different than music. Because music, you invent new music and compose music on a piano that exists uh, or a guitar that exists. And you do brilliant things with this object that exists. In magic, besides the deck of cards, putting aside the deck of cards kind of magic, um, I have to create a new piano each time. I have to build a new piano, new technology each time. Before the story, before the performance, before the lighting, before all any of those things, uh, the technology has to be created brand new. You can't rely on the same piano, you know. And so it's an interesting challenge. It takes a long time, five, seven years, three years at minimum, to create something that's genuinely new. Not a replication that's done in the past, but something's genuinely new. But I enjoy the process at the end. <laughs> the process is hard. But um, um, what was your question? Well, it's, it's about that. I, I was interested in impossibility and, and the fact that, that you see something that's seemingly impossible happening and the impact that has on you. I think, you know, to me, as you know, when you experience something that is really wondrous, that amazes you or amazes me, it's a gift to get that because of the way we think. We constantly decode things all the time. For me, it's never about fooling people. It's about really showing them something that is wondrous or inspiring. You know, um, you know, I'm going to turn this back at you. Um, you're a brilliant psychologist, talented magician. Why do you do? Why do you like what you do? How come you like what you do? In terms of, of magic and psychology. The whole thing. I mean, you know, your whole being is combining those things together, right? The books you've written are about that. But why? What's the thing that makes you? I mean, I know what make what makes me. What's the analogy to me? Me is I need to tell these stories. I need to to make people feel certain things. I need to to express myself like a songwriter would express themselves or a filmmaker. And I um, use magic to do it. What's your purpose? What's the bottom line of Richard Wiseman? Um, I suppose two things. Uh, one is I enjoy thinking about illusion and magic. I find it endlessly fascinating because at one level you have what we call effects, which are impossible things, and then you have methods, how you do them, and, and both psychologically are fascinating. And when an audience sees magic, it's really odd because when you see a play, you have to sort of suspend your, your disbelief. You have to sort of think this play is happening. Uh, but when they, they see a, your show, at some level, they have to know it's real. They, they have to know that box is empty before you produce something from it. So I find it psychologically interesting. It does mean personally, I think I'm reasonably okay at explaining complicated stuff fairly simply. And, and so I enjoy the challenge of taking some really complicated psychology or the entire history of magic and, and the uh, uh, magic world and, 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 and packaging that up in a way that excites people and informs them and doesn't cut corners, has the right amount of simplicity, but not too much. And, and that was always the, you know, the challenge with this, this book was, was to, to, to get people 
you know, it's a love letter to magic, I think, to, to share our, our, our kind of passion for this, this bizarre world. And it's clarity. I mean, I think the book makes it uh, understandable and clear. And that's, you know, how can people relate to those things? How can that touch people? Um, you know, uh, Priscilla Painton, our editor, who is brilliant, uh, editor from Time Magazine, she's an amazing editor. She uh, she got it, and it was important to her to say, "What is it? when you go through this stuff? Why do these things resonate with you? You know, why is that?" And you know, when I do the tour, I do it for you know eight people at a time, and it's mostly for laymen or you know, educators or or uh, the press. And you know, we found a way to make it interesting for people that know nothing about magic. And that whole psychology behind it and that introduction, that frame of why should we care about this stuff? You care about it because it really impacted the world and impacted many ways. And people don't, you know, impacted art, the posters, the uh, how things are shot, all those things influenced uh, all different kind of, uh, all different kinds of art forms. And uh, uh, making it vital, making it interesting and making clear uh, is really fun to do. And I think that's right. And also we should say, I mean, it's, it's obviously a, a book um, for adults, but it absolutely, you know, it, children, kids, the, the illustrations and the, the text is straightforward. So any kid into magic, I, I hope the book would work for them and get them excited in the same way as I used to read books like this when I was a kid. And, and you go, oh my goodness, there's a whole past here. It's hundreds of years of history for me to get into. Yeah. Which, which, you know, my whole beginning was never to learn about magic history. I didn't, I didn't had, have an interest. In it. I knew enough about how things work to create my own things. It was always about inventing things. And then when I acquired one fifth of this um, called the Mulholland Library, uh, it was half of Houdini's library and all kinds of amazing things. I realized it wasn't about the stuff. It wasn't about history. It was about people people that were interacting with each other having the same challenges as me. And that made it resonate with me. And then, I, then suddenly I started to take an interest in it. It wasn't history, oh my God, history. It was history of people and, and, and things that you'll really relate to those people in this book. Um, also the, the, the book, here we, we are pitching this book hard, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> the book itself, if you look at it, on a coffee table, it's just a beautiful coffee, just having it there to flip through, it's beautiful, and to have just there on that coffee table. You know, with every other fantastic book on art and and, and science and, uh, and literature that's on a coffee table, uh, it's just great for that, it's a great gift. Well, I think I say a good place. I think our time is up. Uh, thanks to everyone who submitted uh, all the questions. I know we couldn't get to all of them, but we got to as many uh, as, as we could. Good uh, question. I, I, <laughs> one last pitch for the uh, uh, for the book. There's David signing one there. As I said before, I think the link is below uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the this video and also has been coming up during it. And of course, we'd love you uh, to, to click on that and to, to order the book. Uh, thank you all very much for, for tuning in and watching. And of course, huge thanks uh, to the legendary uh, Mr. David Copperfield. Thank you very much for your time, David. Thank you so much. Have fun. Pleasure. Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.